welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. I am your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Thank you to our generous underwriters on Sharper Iron, the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. And Luther Classical College, a college for Lutherans by Lutherans, opening in fall 2025. Learn more at lutherclassical.org. On this Friday, August 12th, we're studying Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 22 to 33. Moses recounts what happened after the Lord gave the Decalogue, how Israel recognized God's grace to them and desired that Moses would go and hear more of what God would say to them. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us returning guest, the Reverend Dr. Ryan Teets. Dr. Teets serves as Associate Professor of Exegetical Theology and Dean of Students at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Dr. Teets, welcome back to Sharper Iron. Oh, it is fun to be back, and the last time you gave me a hard text, it's nice to deal with Hebrew that's a lot more manageable. <laughs> I think the last time you and I talked about part of Habakkuk, and so Deuteronomy is a little bit easier to translate. Oh, yeah, I feel like I know my Hebrew again. I know like Habakkuk. I think it was the tale of Habakkuk 3, which is notoriously difficult, as opposed to this <laughs> text, which is, oh, easy Hebrew, but in terms of theology, just absolutely rich. Oh, very good. Well, let's let's talk a little bit of context. We're in Deuteronomy 5, uh, the end of the chapter. What should we know as we prepare to look at this rich text? Oh, uh, one where Deuteronomy is always a fun book to deal with. This is the uh, Romans of the Old Testament, if you will. So super comprehensive. Here's where you've been. Here's where you're going. And we just got done with the Ten Commandments. So we now have the wrap-up to the Ten Commandments where the people have that that really kind of nasty tension here. I mean, they're they're super excited because their God speaks to them, unlike their other the other gods of their neighbors. But there are consequences of having a God who appears and who also speaks. So they're living in that tension of, or to use the old classic law and gospel, if you will. With the with the Ten Commandments, we talked about those in the the previous show, and that's obviously a very foundational text for the Book of Deuteronomy for the Old Testament. What what is it about the the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, that makes it so foundational? Yeah, actually, one of the we and there's all kinds of ways that this has been rationalized over the years or described by theologians. I have to say, what we're going to discover actually is in verse 22, where we have this convenient use of both a perfect verb and also this act of writing. That gives them a different significance than, say, the rest of the uh, the rest of the uh, legal material. Okay, well, let's let's go ahead and look at the text, and we'll start digging into that. This is Deuteronomy five, beginning at verse twenty-two. These words the Lord spoke to all your assembly at the mountain, at the mountain, out of the midst of the fire, the cloud, and the thick darkness, with a loud voice, and he added no more, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone and gave them to me. And as soon as you heard the voice out of the midst of the darkness, while the mountain was burning with fire, you came near to me, all the heads of your tribes and your elders. And you said, Behold, the Lord our God has shown us his glory and greatness, and we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. This day we have seen God speak with man, and man still live. Now therefore, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us. If we hear the voice of the Lord our God any more, we shall die. For who is there of all flesh that he has heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the midst of the fire as we have, and has still lived? Go near and hear all that the Lord our God will say, and speak to us all that the Lord our God will speak to you, and we will hear and do it. And the Lord heard your words when you spoke to me. And the Lord said to me, I have heard the words of this people, which they have spoken to you. They are right in all that they have spoken. Oh, that they had such a mind as this always, to fear me and to keep all my commandments, that it might go well with them and with their descendants forever. Go and say to them, Return to your tents. But you stand here by me, and I will tell you the whole commandment and the statutes and the rules that you shall teach them, that they may do them in the land that I am giving them to possess. You shall be careful, therefore, to do as the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left, You shall walk in all the way that the Lord your God has commanded you, that you may live, and that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land that you shall possess. That's our text for today. That's Deuteronomy 5, verses 22 to 33. 
So, Dr. Teets, you mentioned verse 22 already, that the fact that the the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, they get written down on two tablets is a, a pretty significant thing. Uh, what I assume these words at the beginning of verse 22, that's referring back to what we, we read yesterday at the beginning of the chapter? Exactly. And note, uh, Hebrew likes to play around with its syntax here. So typically, as I grill into my poor, sweet, innocent, okay, maybe, okay, we're not sweet or innocent, my Hebrew students at the SEM, <laughs> Uh, typically we go with verb, subject, object, but you already notice that the first three words in Hebrew, so the et ha devarim ha elah, uh, definite direct object marker, uh, these words, is that Moses is already letting us know that what just happened was where the emphasis should be. By fronting the definite direct object here, these words, already that points to the significance of what happened before. And the, Yeah. Keep going, keep going. Okay, yeah, and the uh, other key point that uh, happens, there's a lot going on, this is just fun, is that we go straight from these words to this wonderful recounting of the theophany with some pretty rich language as well. What What is a, a theophany, Dr. Teets? That's a, I don't know that's a word we've used yet here on, on Sharper Iron. <laughs> oh, the curse of speaking in tongues on occasion, which starts weird rumors, <laughs> I guess. Uh, divine, uh, divine appearance, if you will. And if that's and if you take a look just going forward a bit, and we may need to backtrack after that, is we have this really great combination. We go from uh, Haish, the fire and the cloud, uh, echoes of Exodus here big time, the fire and the cloud that goes with it. It's actually this third word that in the uh, ESV is rendered as a thick darkness. Uh, Ar- uh, Artapel would be the Hebrew there. Is that this just isn't any sort of a gloomy day in in say San Francisco to pick a random, completely out of the blue example for somebody who lives in Fort Wayne. Uh, this is a uh, this is a darkness with supernatural qualities to it. It's not just a getting dark out, outside that a storm is coming. Uh, this is a, a divine darkness, if you will. Is it is it related? And I I don't have my Hebrew out for this, but is it related to the the ninth plague of darkness? Is it that same word? Uh, no, you know? actually, better yet, it uh, looks towards the day of Yahweh. Oh, so we see this word our pill that actually shows up in a Zephaniah one fifteen in particular, where this is the description of God coming to judge, God coming to set anything order. It's not referred to a natural phenomenon; it's always supernatural. I okay. don't believe here. Okay, you're going to force me to. No, okay, this is going to bug me. The joys of having enough resources in front of me. I don't believe. Uh, don't believe it shows up in the plague. No, it does not. At okay. least I, okay. I can't see I just it. knew that. Yeah. I remember that darkness being a, a darkness. I think it's described as a darkness that you can feel. Yeah. But but this I like. So let's let's travel down that that rabbit hole a little bit. This this is the a connection to the day of the Lord, the day of Yahweh. How is how is the giving of the Decalogue on Mount Sinai a, a day of the Lord where judgment comes? Yeah. Uh, I, one thing I emphasize so much when I teach is all theology is eschatology. It's all looking towards Christ's first and second comings. That whenever we see Yom Yahweh, the day of Yahweh, the day of the Lord happening, uh, this is whenever God sets things in order. So what has already happened now with the Decalogue giving, uh, and we'll see this later, we have multiple words for assembly, elders, tribes. It's it's comprehensive in, who, in terms of who's being gathered here. Is that with this, uh, God has now put or, put his people in order. He set things the way things are supposed to be. Then looking forward to days of Yahweh, or to the day of Yahweh, which happens over and over again, again, escalating, looking for that, uh, the uh, day of the Lord that we pray for when we say that innocent table prayer, come Lord Jesus. Mm-hmm. When we look for that, it's all these times where God sets everything right. We're back to Eden. We're back to the way things are supposed to be. Well, and yet at the same time with the day of the Lord, it's got this. So we, as Christians, we pray for it. I mean, the come Lord Jesus, this is the prayer of the Christian church always. And yet when it comes up, say, in the minor prophets, there's this uh, Amos, I think very famously, why are you looking for it? It's going to be a day of destruction for you. There's some fear involved, certainly here in, in the recounting of it in Deuteronomy 5 and, and back in Exodus 20. So how do, how do those things go together? The the fear of this day of the Lord, the the judgment that's coming and yet the anticipation of the the christian yeah we we long for things to be in order but the consequences are severe you can't underestimate that this isn't a what a friend we have in we can't say that this is a what a friend we have in jesus moment 
uh, no offense to that hymn, it doesn't do justice for how overawing this is. That when God comes, two things happen. Uh, evil is destroyed and, and the remnant is restored. And it's that utter destruction of evil. And th- this is where the prophets, because they're making that call to repent, are just so utterly adamant. Uh, yeah, Amos as well. Uh, one of my favorite chapters, frankly, to deal with. One of those funny surprises when I was teaching. Uh, I was trying to race through material, and I got to Zephaniah 1 and accidentally spent three times longer than I had intended on it. Yeah. Because it's just this, and it's the uh, sweeping back and forth. But within that, God's people say, God always provides salvation and provides rest. So who can stand? Well, the person who takes refuge in, in in the coming of Jesus, in the coming of the Lord. So with it, I mean, how do then, you talked about the the eschatology, looking forward to, at least, and when I hear eschatology, I generally think of the second coming yeah. of Christ, the, the appearance for which we are still waiting. But this, this day of the Lord, the thick darkness that we're seeing here in Deuteronomy 5, how does that connect to Christ's first coming? Oh, uh, the biggest example is all of these examples, when we talk Yom Yahweh, day of, day of the Lord, which looks back towards the Exodus and looks forward to the new Exodus. And we see it most, most vividly in the crucifixion. It's not that darkness is not just something scary, something noteworthy. It's something with massive theological significance. Hmm. Namely that Jesus on the cross on, yeah. means the come. Oh, the day of the Lord is at hand. Okay. So let me, and I'm, I'm as, as I'm thinking through this, listening to you, this is kind of the connection I'm trying to make with the 10 commandments, the Decalogue, being this foundational material for the people of Israel. Here is his will for your life. As we talked about yesterday, this was God's will before it was written down. This is this has been in place, but now he's given it to them. This this thick darkness pointing toward the day of the Lord. You know, we, we talked about that one of the things in the giving of the Decalogue is that we, we do see our sin and our need for a Savior. It is because we could not fulfill the Decalogue that Christ came. Is that, I mean, is, is there a connection there? So that the darkness on on this day is a reminder that the day of the Lord is coming. It's going to come upon Christ, our Savior, instead of us. We couldn't fulfill these words. He did, but then he receives that, that day of the Lord in our place. Yeah, and look at what it drives the people for, people to here in the text. They ha- they're they dealing with the artipel. They're dealing with that supernatural, thick, eschatological darkness, I think that's now the new official RSV translation, the infamous Ryan Standard version of that, <laughs> is that what it drives them to is this, oh, is that we can't do this. Wow, it's great that God's telling us what to do, but we're absolutely toast here. So we must have a savior. We must have a mediator. This drives their requ- their demand and their right demand. The text is very happy about the request that there's somebody who can mediate between them and the holy God. All right. So, okay, all this from just that, that eschatological darkness, that's the, the thick darkness that's there, part of the theophany, the Lord appearing there on Mount Sinai. Uh, in verse 22, Moses says, he, the Lord, added no more, and then he wrote these things on two tablets of stone. Talk a little bit more about the significance of the Lord writing these. Oh, actually, back up. The, uh, wor- okay. the two words before that are, are even better. Oh, both are actually really important. It's that lo yasaf, uh, he did not uh, do again or did not add any more. Uh, the verbal aspect of Yosef is key here. So just for just for the uh, wide audience that I'm speaking to and realizing I do speak in tongues on occasion, is that this notion of that Hebrew doesn't do tense the way we do it in English. It's not talking future past like we do in English. Instead, Hebrew talks in terms of kind of action. So this verbal aspect, and we call it aspect, right, when we, when we spend time in Hebrew, is that the aspect here is in Hebrew what we call the perfect aspect. It means it's completed. So he did not add again. He did not do ever again. It's probably about the better way to render that. So these words are over, and they will never be repeated. They'll never be increased. So we go from these words are over to this notion of writing. And at least I'm assuming most of us write, at least least to-do lists who are listening. Mm -hmm. At least I have a few hundred lists right now, but I'm that I'm that I'm thankful to be able to ignore while while doing this program with you. I'm writing notes as you're talking. Okay, okay, good. You at least you're writing. <laughs> is that, that for us writing is just it, it's an ordinary activity. We take it for granted. We write things down. You do your to do list. But if you 
follow this motif of writing in the Bible, I think most of us would be surprised actually at how rare it appears. We, we're so used to, and, and we rightfully talk about God's written word as being authoritative. We savor God's written Bible. We savor writing. But for the most part, the ex- actual examples of writing the Bible are few and far between. Mm-hmm. So we have this example here. Uh, Job has it, uh, Job 19, oh, that my words were written. Uh, Habakkuk, when God was responding to Habakkuk's complaint in Habakkuk 2, he says, write this, write this down so that a person won't miss it. And then uh, shows up a couple times in Isaiah. As a, uh, and it's the same thing where when it shows up, this is a pay attention hearer moment. Right. And, and if you have ever spent time in the ancient Near East, one thing we're spoiled with here in Fort Wayne is that we're three hours from lots of cool stuff. Uh, one of my favorite museums is the Oriental Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago. They are the uh, how, oh everybody has to claim have a claim to fame. Their claim to fame is they're the leading study uh, leading leading center of Akkadian studies. And at this mm-hmm. point, hopefully, I haven't lost my hearers because you hear Akkadian and. And if anybody studied Akkadian, it's everything you like about a Semitic language that makes it hard. Plus, it's case endings like Greek. It's a bear. But if you go there, you actually see these this gigantic Lamassu. It's the Assyrian chief griffin-like deity, if you will. It's a head of a man, a bull-like body. And if you go behind it, you see writing that nobody would have been able to see. It's taken from a Khorsabad palace. And this thing is roughly 30 by 20 by probably 50 feet. It's a gigantic chunk of rock. And when you see that writing, it tells us that what happens here has lasting validity. Uh, Writing is what an empire does to impose or demonstrate its power, its will for whoever happens to pass by it. So the fact that this is written down, just that act of writing says, pay attention to this, because not everything gets written down. That's the that's the point. Very few things get written. Very few things are explicitly written down in the Old Testament. Yeah. Uh, very yeah. similar to save you, uh, Hammurabi's code. I mean, this there are plenty of examples that Moses' hearers w- would have been aware of when they're walking by the road. They see these stella. Oh, this is what the we may not be able to read it, but we know this is the imperial authority for all time. Let me go back to the the perfect aspect that you brought out, that he did not add any more, that this is completed, it's over, not to be increased or repeated. Uh, it, it sounds like the way that that would have been understood then, when Jesus comes along and in the Sermon on the Mount says, it, it is written, but I say to you, they're going to be, I mean, mind blown kind of moment there. <laughs> oh, man, I never saw that before. Yeah, you're totally right. That, Yeah, uh, well, we, we, we read Deuteronomy. We know that this, oh, ironically, though, they're already dealing with an oral Torah, so they're already adding to it. But yeah, it is the, okay, somebody greater than Moses is now here. Yeah. And we talk about, and right. this is going to, we're going to see this, this text is really driving us towards the role of a mediator, but also looking towards the new Moses as well, which Deuteronomy will pick up later. Yeah, that's right. We, we talked a little bit about that yesterday, but it comes through even more clearly in, in this text today. So moving then into to verse 23, we start to get the reaction of the people. They, they recognize this theophany, and how do they begin to react in, in verses 23 and following? They have a bit of a problem. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It's, uh, yeah, it happened, it happened when you heard uh, the voice from the midst of the darkness. And that word for darkness, for those of you keeping score at home, that's just boring old regular darkness. It's just Hoshek. Okay. But what they're also seeing is this constant theophany. It's the mountain is burning. There's a participle there. It's an ongoing action and the fire. Uh, and you'll notice who gathers. Uh, so you all gathered to me, namely the chief of the tribes and also the elders. So now, really, in the course of a whopping two verses here, we've gone from your kind of general word for the assembly, the the kahal, to now, okay, your your different leadership groups. Uh, they are absolutely, oh, shall we say, uh, concerned about this very scary state, this fire and this darkness. So even in the the use of the, just the the elders, the heads of the tribes, this is already starting the idea of a mediator just in who gets sent. It's not everybody that shows up to Moses, but it, it's like, you you go a little bit closer. You deal with this. We're going to hang back here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, go be brave. We're perfectly happy being cowards. 
but given what they're seeing, you can't exactly you can't exactly blame the mirror. Right, right. Well, and it is it's striking just to to notice that as Moses recounts it, because at the beginning of this chapter, at the beginning of chapter five, which we we've said is is the start of Moses's second sermon here. He actually summons all Israel. So he's got all Israel listening to him at this point. You you see him fulfilling the mediatorial role at the moment, and yet he's recounting this time when I guess that was a that was established very firmly and, and done so in stages. So the, the people are afraid. They recognize God is there on this mountain. He's still there. The mountain is burning. We need we need help with this. So what what do they begin to request of Moses in verse twenty four? Yeah, and, and it's very really odd. They they hear, but what do we find out they were seeing stuff is that here we hear the voice, but then their problem is really the problem that the book of Leviticus has already addressed before, uh, before Deuteronomy. Uh, they have a God who's totally different. We've seen him uh, and that language of Kavod, his glory. Uh, I'm going to, at the risk of sounding like a systematician, which I dabble in on occasion, if necessary, uh, Kavod there is language, glory is typically English translation. Uh, better yet, we've seen his real presence, which I realize is suspiciously systematic in how I translated it. So we've seen him, oh, his his real presence. Kavod is not just exciting, crazy stuff, uh, crazy, shining stuff. We've seen his presence. And we've heard. And they are absolutely amazed here that oh that they can actually see god and live and this contrast between who god is and who mortal man is that they're starting to develop here okay so they they recognize that this has been a moment where they should have died yeah and and they they got that from the book of leviticus talk a little bit more about this the kavod of yahweh the the glory uh, that word's also related to like a heaviness a weightiness right? i mean how does what yeah. what is the kavod yahweh yeah it, it's been with the people now for a while it's the kavod yahweh that's been in the fire that they've been following throughout the wilderness wanderings is that this is God's real presence. And the closest thing to the closest word that's connected to it is the word uh, holy. Uh, mm -hmm. We all make silly mistakes when we, we all say silly things when we teach Bible study as a pastor. And once I was zipping through a, a two, uh, two year guided tour of the Bible, and of course running behind, I got to Leviticus and I infamously said, Leviticus, who needs this book? Let's move on to something more interesting. Uh, note to self, don't say silly stuff like that. Uh, because the head of the LWML informed me that that was her favorite book. Wow. Uh, yeah, I've been doing penance for that ever since then. Uh, don't skip over Leviticus. Yeah, don't skip over Leviticus. <laughs> because Leviticus, with this notion of Kavod closely connected to God's holiness, isn't so much God being God's bigness, if you will. Like, even with the language of holiness, we the kind of the Pavlovian response is to render that as set apart something many of us were taught at seminary is that it's not so much that it's both that God is different but it's also that God desires and God's plan is to is incarnational it's to dwell with people so when we see this language of kavod it just isn't that God is awesome you could probably do some silly contemporary song of an awesome God right there perhaps but rather it is that God is both awesome, but also God dwells. And the problem that the people are up against, and this is why that book of Leviticus, again, st I'm doing now penance for, pro oh, I think I'm on about 16 years of penance for that silly comment, if I'm doing the math right, is that what's going on here is that it's great to have a God that dwells with us, or and to use the language more specific here to Deuteronomy, it's so great to have a God that talks to us. But the problem is, what can we? How can we stand? Because if because unless we're holy, uh, God's holiness or and God's kavod, God's glory is utterly devastating. It will annihilate us. And so, not to not to put words into the mouth of your your LWML leader, but I mean, then the reason that the Book of Leviticus would be so precious to someone is because the Book of, of Leviticus describes how in the Old Testament. God bridged that gap that that He made Himself available to His people so that they could come into His holiness without dying. That, that's how the Book of Leviticus becomes a wonderful book. Yeah, for for a book that is nothing but obscure imperatives, obscure commands, it is the most gospel-filled book of the entire Old Testament. 
Yeah, who who would? Yeah, again, I uh, the the I, I love I love teaching Bible study because you end up learning much in spite of yourself sometimes. That's right. That's right. So we, the Leviticus is the gospel of the Old Testament. You're saying Deuteronomy is the Romans of the Old Testament. So we're we're talking about some great stuff here from from Moses. And I I, I don't think we can say much more about this without moving on to what John says in in his prologue that this connects to what he says about the Word becoming flesh dwelling among us so that we see his glory. And it sounds like John's drawing from all this oh, theology. And you'll notice what John John's making a great move here. Because what he's doing is actually playing around with two different concepts at once. So we've seen his glory. So this is the God's incarnational presence that we see in Christ. But also, John makes sure we that we don't miss the incarnational presence. That in the Old Testament, you may not, oh, the Old Testament is there. John is just wonderfully explicit here. It's that language of pitching his tent or tabernacling that's going on. So John's using just really, really explicit uh, temple language and tabernacle language. That, yeah, here's a God, here's a God who dwells. The God who dwells, oh, and in Jesus we have the temple, which is something that John plays around with and John develops quite a bit in his gospel. Yeah, yeah, and, and in Jesus, our new temple, we see this glory that the people saw there, and we don't die either because he has mediated himself, and and that's where that's where this text is is pointing us is to Jesus as mediator. But we we do need to to take a break. You're listening to Sharper Iron here on KFUO. We're looking at Deuteronomy five with Dr. Ryan Teets. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Did you know that Lutherans are helping new American immigrants get settled? How about struggling church workers in need of support and refreshment? And we assist at-risk children and provide disaster response to hurricane victims. Through LCMS recognized service organizations, we are doing all this and more. I'm Rahema Kavuga of Lutheran Church Extension Fund, and I don't want you to miss out on hearing what your brothers and sisters in Christ are up to. Visit interesttime.org to see how your support gives life to these works of mercy and love. What do you think of when you hear the word college? Expensive? Liberal? Woke? Imagine a college that is affordable. A college that is unapologetically conservative and Lutheran. A college that won't take a dime of federal funding. A college that teaches the best of our Western heritage. A college where students grow in the Christian faith instead of leaving it behind. This is Luther Classical College. A college by Lutherans and for Lutherans. Visit our website, lutherclassical.org. Subscribe, become a patron, and join the thousands who are making Luther Classical College a reality. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Friday, August 12th. We're studying Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 22 to 33 with the Reverend Dr. Ryan Teets. He is Associate Professor of Exegetical Theology and Dean of Students at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Dr. Teets, prior to the break, we were talking about the reaction of the people at Mount Sinai, how they realize they have seen and they have heard God and they haven't died. And it seems like, I don't know, I don't want to be impious here, but they don't want to press their luck anymore. They, they, they say, this happened once. I don't think we can handle that again. Moses, you do something about it. So verse 25, why should we die? Uh, talk more about their their reasoning here. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it actually, what's weird and you, you go, am I being impious or not? The people are making the are saying the exact same thing that you just said. Uh, they are, oh, it's great, but maybe Moses, you can take one for the team here. Uh, and the problem that they're up against, it's a, both a problem and also just absolutely beautiful, is that they're up against the idea that, oh, that their God is a God who's living, mm. as opposed to, as opposed to the people who are what puny mortals, I think is the technical term here, this notion of, okay, our God, our God lives, which is totally, which is, brings out a lot of the language that Deuteronomy has already been focusing it on against the dead idols. It's a big upset, a big issue for Deuteronomy. Right, right. So he, God is God is living in the sense that he is he is the true God as opposed to dead idols. He is he is the living God in in opposition to those uh, puny mortal, not opposition, but in contrast right. to the to the puny mortals. And I, I suppose one of the things that probably comes out of this text is that you know he's the living God who actually then gives life instead of the death that his people deserved. He's he's the living God who bestows this life by his grace upon these people here on the mountain. God always provides atonement, and that's that's a piece that we see oh, from Genesis Genesis three onward. 
that there's always a covering of sin that only God can provide. It's and it's all gift talk. Yeah. Yeah. So so that's what I mean. So again, they recognize that God is the living God. And, and yet at the same time, and, and they recognize this is unique. Who else has has experienced this like we have and is still alive? It is. And I know it's, it's quite maybe it's a bit striking. Moses seems like the obvious choice as a mediator, because I suppose he did hear God speak out of the midst of a fire, the burning bush, and he lived. So Moses, there's a lot of good reasons for him to be their mediator in this case. Oh, yeah. And uh I mean, granted, this is Deuteronomy recounting a past event, but yeah, uh, he will get that great bit, oh, the great piece in uh, in Exodus uh, where he gets the uh, the Lord, the Lord of God is compassion and, and, and slow to anger. He has God come, oh, actually sees the backside of God. So he's actually done it. Although if you want to get perhaps a little unnecessarily cynical here, my how convenient, um, uh, he's already there anyway. So he seems to be doing okay. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, again, they, they've they heard the voice. They've seen God. They recognize he is the living God. We are mere mortals. We are sinners. If this continues, we'll die. It's never happened before. So they, they request in verse 27, Moses, well, what, what is there? What do they want to happen? What's the, what's the proposition they put forward? That they want to hear the voice of God, but they want to hear it indirectly. They need to have somebody to stand between them and the and the awesome holiness, the awesome glory of God. So the draw near, and it's, yeah, draw near you. Uh, the Hebrew there in 26 is even kind of uh, kind of abrupt. Uh, draw near you. If it's an unnecessary you there, it's actually redundant in the Hebrew. So, yeah, you, you, go over there and, and here. All right, so so there they say, Moses, you go listen. God will speak to you. Then you come back, speak to us, and then uh, we, I suppose it's worth at least mentioning we'll hear and do it. They, uh, they show their 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 desire to be faithful at this point. Yeah, and it's really easy for us, to, at least for me, when I was going through this a couple times, where I'm like, okay, this wow, these people are they're they're cowards. Mm-hmm. But if you their language here is incredibly pious. Uh, they pro- they will hear, they will do, and you'll notice that that word our it's not just that God, it's our God. They are completely in relationship with God throughout all of this. It isn't just that God. It just isn't the God over there, but it's really personal. And because they know who God is, they are both awe-inspired, but also knowing who they are, there's this element of already confessing their sins, perhaps. Well, I, just to, again, put this in the context of Moses is recounting what happened in the book of Exodus, and he's doing so to the people who are on the cusp of entering into the promised land. There was a very striking note toward the beginning of the sermon where Moses said to them, you know, this covenant God didn't make with your fathers, he made it with you. It, it wasn't just for the people standing there at the mountain. And so just thinking through like Moses as a preacher here and the way that he recounts it, he does so in a way that invites the people who are listening to him to put themselves at that spot to be saying these same things so that the Lord is is their God, not just the God of their fathers, but their God still today. Yeah, it's that old, uh, what, Good Friday hymn, were you there? And the answer is, in this case, we actually, we were. <laughs> and yeah, they are they are full participants, even though these events happened before they were born. And the scary thing, them, and this is where Moses as a preacher Okay, uh, I dare I say it. He's brilliant. Is he's given them this wonderfully optimistic picture, but they already know the rest of the story here. That that generation that was yeah yeah we, we will we will keep we will do yeah go 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 Moses. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, they're all going to die off. <laughs> well, and and he has recounted that previously in yeah, the book of Deuteronomy. Right. You know, yeah, but it is it is striking how. In the way that he preaches, I, I think that's okay. Yeah, Moses is a brilliant preacher. In the way that he preaches, he reminds these people, this new generation, of those moments of faithfulness so that they would seek to imitate those moments of faithfulness and then also clearly warns them about their unfaithfulness so that they would seek to avoid that. I mean, I, I, he is a brilliant preacher. Yeah, he's uh, using the older generation as a pretty powerful case study. You talk about a great that's sermon right. illustration. Use the older generation. That's right. Well, and, and what's I mean, he uses himself as the example too. Sometimes, yeah. you know, he he several times he's brought up the fact that he's not going to get to go into the promised land himself, uh, which is yeah, that's that's part of his example. So he's recounted again the people's response. They've heard the Lord's word. They've 
they recognize the Lord's grace in that, but they also say, we need to keep hearing it through a mediator. So that's their request. In verse 28, the Lord hears and he responds, and he's pleased with what the people have, have said. Talk a little bit about the Lord's response. Yeah, and it, I mean, here I, I thought I knew the text, and I see that, and I'm. it almost drew me up short, thinking it sounded, it was so easy to blame these people as being impious. Instead, God realizes that they must have a mediator to, to save them, that there must be somebody who can stand in their place. And God's response, oh, we have a holy God who always provides a way for his people to be holy. In this case, it's that provider of the mediator. Well, and I think this is an important point, because, you know, the Lord says in verse 28, I've, I've heard everything that they said to you, Moses. And then he says, they are right in all that they have spoken. And I, I know for me, too, when I was reading through the text at first, and I said they are right. Well, of course they're right. They want to keep hearing the word of the Lord. But I think it's this is a, a bigger thing. They are right, not only in their desire to hear the word of the Lord, but they're right in desiring to hear the word of the Lord through a mediator. That request for Moses to be this, this go-between, that is part of God's pleased with that part of their request, not just that they want to hear the word, but that they want to hear it through Moses. Why, why is that? Why is God pleased by that? Oh, one, because God knows that they need a savior. And Moses, by being that mediator, is the one who can uh, provide salvation by speaking to them directly. He And God perhaps, oh, I don't know, I'm trying to come up with a good way to describe this, is that that this is so different than, like, stay tuned for the debate, do we have a king or not, where, where the, there's pretty mixed evidence, but there, that God has always used special instruments. So what they're actually requesting isn't all that unique. We've always had a Moses. We've always had a certain person who is the God's agent to deliver God's word to us. So what they're asking for isn't actually particularly unique. They're actually, oh, go with what God is. Oh, may God act the way God has always act, acted. Hmm. Hmm. Which, I mean, that's not always the response of the people of Israel to recognize that God has acted one way in the past and to expect him to act that way in the future. They've, they've missed the boat on that many times that, you know, Hey, he brought us out of Egypt. Why to kill us in the wilderness? I mean, they've they've missed the boat on that one. So they're they're getting it here. Yeah, I mean, this is so unique, and why why it really did just kind of threw me for oh, it threw me for a loop when I was going through the text. Like I, I thought I knew who this generation was. My problem is I spend too much time in the Book of Numbers where I know exactly what where they what they end up doing. That's right. So, so here they they recognized God has acted this way in the past. He has always spoken His word through a mediator of some sort. In asking for that again, they recognize God's faithfulness to speak His word to provide a mediator. Now, in terms of of Moses being the mediator, we know that he's not the perfect one. So, how does how do, without just jump beating around the bush anymore? How does this point us forward to Christ as the okay. mediator? Yeah, we have the setup for later in Deuteronomy where Moses says there's going to be a prophet. I'm going that God is going to raise up a prophet like me from among your people. And the the best you know, we see this actually in two big spots in the New Testament to be really explicit. When you are actually brought up, uh, you have heard in the days of old this, but let me tell you what's really going on. Uh, Jesus, especially in Matthew's gospel, is the uh, the uh, teacher to end all teachers, or the super rabbi, if you will. He is the one who says, okay, here's God's authoritative word, in a way, and he is Moses, Moses par excellence, or to go a little bit more flippant, if you will, Moses on steroids, the real Moses. Uh, sorry for any Mark McGuire fans at that, knowing that's a dated reference. The other big piece is actually how we understand the Transfiguration account. Uh, it's at least the way that I was taught, and perhaps your hearers as well, is that, okay, Moses and Elijah show up. Okay, great. Um, and it is great. So now we have the Law and the Prophets. But that has never quite worked, because last I checked, Elijah didn't write anything. I don't, at least my Bible doesn't have a book of Elijah yet, or yet, that doesn't have a book of Elijah, is that both of these figures, both Moses and Elijah at the Transfiguration, they are the coming figures that anticipate Jesus. So Moses, when he says, there is a prophet like me, that a prophet like me will, among your people will come. Oh, now here we have Moses next to Jesus. Jesus is the new Moses. In the same way, by the way, that's 
uh, Malachi talks about there will be Elijah's coming. So when you have Elijah next to Jesus, here is the new Moses, who's both a lawgiver, but also one who pleads on behalf of, of God's people. Hmm. Well, I mean, I think there's a number of ways to, to connect the, the transfiguration to to Moses as the mediator. One of, you're mentioning them already. Another one with Moses and Elijah that I, I've heard, and I I think is is helpful is that both Moses and Elijah in the in the Old Testament are known for having spoken to God on mount on a mountain, particularly Mount Mount Horeb. And here they are again, Moses and Elijah on a mountain. And who are they talking to? Well, they're they're talking to God still, which yeah. I think is, is quite right. striking. And I mean, you already brought that up. I mean, here the word is the word made flesh that, that dwelt among us. Uh, yeah, they. Oh, here we have. Uh, here we are. Here they are. Here we have God's glory in a mountain with both Moses and Elijah. Yeah. Well, and and then the other thing, and you mentioned Deuteronomy eighteen within that text about the the prophet who is coming. The command in Deuteronomy eighteen is to listen to him, and that's what the the father's voice echoes there on the Mount of, of Transfiguration. Here's here's my beloved son. Listen to him. Very very clearly marking Jesus as this this new and better mediator, better than Moses. Yeah, and what's when we start pointing around with that trajectory again? When I were jumping ahead, what thirteen chapters in Deuteronomy, is that every prophet sees himself as a new Moses, but every prophet is looking for the greatest Moses to come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and I, I suppose I mean with with Saint Paul then when he writes in First Timothy that that Jesus the the man who the God who is also man he's the mediator. That's where Paul draws from all this same same scripture when he calls Jesus our one mediator. Yeah, and what I what's fun of well, there's what I enjoy about the New Testament. Okay, that I I, I, <laughs> I realized quite how that. odd that a shocking a shocking statement on a radio broadcast I just realized is that as somebody I, I spend my entire life in the Old Testament, that's where that's where I've done most of my work, is that when I read the New Testament, I discover that the New Testament is speaking Old Testament constantly. That every one of these images, the New Testament is drawing, the, that the New Testament just throws in there for good measure, is actually drawing upon this absolute rich Old Testament witness. So you, you wouldn't yeah. get what Paul is getting at here when he just throws in that language of mediator, unless you're seeing this whole rich language of a mediator in the Old Testament. Hmm, that's right. That's right. So you again, we need to read the books of Deuteronomy and Leviticus. Our our LWML ladies who who have these favorite books, they are right to be favorite. Uh, I, again, I, I, I've told this story year, uh, over and over over the years, and I still feel like I'm doing my penance for that comment. <laughs> so, Doctor Teets, as, as Moses or as the Lord continues to speak to Moses, he said they're right for asking what they've asked for, and I love verse twenty nine. Oh, oh, that they would always be like this. I mean, that's what a what a wonderful thing for the Lord to say. Oh, and, and it's and it's just the deep longing here. It's the oh yeah, and the, the idiom is literally oh who, who or it's like who who would give or perhaps yeah. even what what I oh to go comp, to almost to go idiomatic English what I wouldn't give that they would have that the, that they would always have this heart and heart again heart is always will that they wouldn't that this isn't a feeling that God's concerned about. It's their will and their will and their desires, which they've just demonstrated as being what God has been looking for. So yeah, the Lord, the Lord expresses his great desire. You see, you do see a picture of, you know, the way Jesus speaks about his, his desire to gather Jerusalem as a hen gathers her, her chicks, this picture of, of God that we see throughout the old and new Testament, that he desires to bring his people to him. He desires their, their faithfulness and for their own good, right? That, that this fear of him and the keeping of his commandments, this, he says, and this comes up more than once as the text continues, it will go well with them and their descendants if they continue in this way. Yeah. These aren't just these just aren't trivial words if you will yeah th this is this is god's justice and that word justice knowing it is highly freighted this is god's plan for the cosmos that he's given them this is how god in, has god made things back in genesis 1 and 2 and how we look towards these towards this being perfected in the new creation yeah, so so he commends their desire. He encourages that continued desire, expresses a longing that it would continue. And then he directs Moses. And again, we're recounting what happened 40 years ago at Mount Sinai. Uh, what does he direct Moses to, to do in regards to this request? That's yeah, uh, verse 30, uh, the, the short verse. Uh, go and return to your tents. Uh, 
So, good job, leave the mountain. Actually, it's more than that. These, because th- this is not only valid at Sinai, it's valid at all of their dwellings. So this notion of go to your tents is actually much bigger than simply, okay, you're right, you probably shouldn't be here, go away. No, it is go to your tents, take this home with you. These words apply wherever you are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and that's exactly where chapter six is going to to take us in in just a few verses in the the very next text. You know, this is the word that you're going to talk about when you're lying down and walking wherever you are. So return to your tents here at Mount Sinai, setting the stage for that. But as for Moses, Moses, stay here and let's keep talking. Take us into thirty one. <laughs> yeah, uh, now we we go from the the ten words, the ten commandments, to now Moses is here. And now Moses is the mediator they were longing for. And this role of teaching is key here in 31. Uh, we can talk about the, the content, and we have uh, lots of words being used here. We have what? Uh, mishvah, hukim, etc. Etc. Et by the way, is not Hebrew. That was me just not wanting to pronounce a word. Is that we have all of this language here, but the key feature is this role of teaching. Uh, what Deuteronomy is all about is that teaching has saving implications. Or to use language that perhaps many of our hearers are more familiar with, uh, catechesis is life. And his role is to catechize the people. So then that's what he, it looks like that's what he does there Mm -hmm. in verse 32. At least in the ESV, Mm -hmm. we have an end of a quote. So God's done speaking. And then in verse 32, now this is Moses once again speaking to the people in front of him. Yeah. And now... And he's setting us up for a lot more teaching, a lot more, a lot more expansion on these ten words. Hmm. And this so language, what is he, and, yeah, this, and this language of going. walking, kind of j- jumping to the end of our text, thirty-three. Yeah, this language of walking now becomes an important way of describing what the life of the faithful believer is. Hmm. So, talk about that language of, of walking. How is that a an apt description of the life of the believer? Because they are. In the wilderness, on the way to the promised land, they've been doing a lot of walking. And after this re- this historical event that Moses is recounting, they are going to be hoofing it even more. And that this notion that we, as the as believers, we are walking on a journey to the promised land, and and how we walk matters. And part of the walking is to be constantly contemplating God's revelation. Uh, Psalm one uh, works with this quite a bit. Where blessed is he who doesn't do this. But instead, what do you do when you walk? You're constantly chewing on God's word. Or to use the language that used to be in the hymnal, you're inwardly digesting it. That's right. That's right. That's still in the, it's in the prayer in the front of the Lutheran study Bible. We often open with that for Bible <laughs> class here at, here in Smithville, that we would inward, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest the Holy Scripture. You know, the, the, and, the Bible is so beautifully concrete because that's where the power is. We may, may, may need to keep it, but that's just an aside that I couldn't resist. Well, with this with this matter of walking, mm-hmm. that that same image shows up at the end of verse uh, thirty two as well. Mm-hmm. That you you shouldn't turn aside to the right or the left. And again, thinking to the, the, about the people to whom Moses is speaking, like they've just gone through however many years of of wandering, depending on when they were born. This is very applicable, real to life language for them. Yeah, and they're walking the path that where God leads them. Without actually knowing what the uh, without knowing the details, it's that walk by trust. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That the, they don't know where the road leads, but that the one leading them. The, and man, how often that shows up within the the book of Exodus and throughout their wilderness wanderings. That and I, you know, I suppose sometimes it might have seemed like, well, why is the Lord leading us that way? It would have been a, a straighter line to go this way, but He's always got the a purpose in mind. And when they follow Him that's when things go well. It's when they start to turn either to the right or to the left. That's where the real wandering happens. Whenever you're following the Lord, that's the actual straight and and narrow path to use more biblical language. And it's simply because that's where God's kavod is. That's where God's glory, God's incarnational presence is. That's what Mm, determines the path. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, so following the Lord, this is not the wandering or the turning, no matter how meandering his path may seem. That is, in fact, walking in his way, following after him. And again, this is this is language that is used all throughout the Old Testament into the New as well. Even, even Jesus himself, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. So that, that language of way, 
here here is another connection to Jesus. Now, as as the text concludes, then you know you shall walk in the way all the way that the Lord your God commanded you, that you may live and that it may go well with you. We have this again this this talk of blessing that will come in keeping these commandments. Can can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, what sounds very conditional in nature. You do this, it'll go well. You don't do this, it won't go well. Talk talk a little about that nature of the of what's being given here. Oh, now now we're back to the to the language of where Deuter- oh, Deuteronomy is all about how are you going to live in the land, and that's where Deuteronomy is taking us. Uh, you get to the end of Deuteronomy, we have what a few blessings and a bunch of curses. I think is is the uh, ratio towards the end of Deuteronomy, yeah. where okay, if you want to be my people, this is how you will look. Otherwise, and, and part of how they look, and we, it's so easy to sound to to uh, move into that world of works righteousness if we're not careful. But God not only commands them to do things, but God always provides a means for them to be forgiven for when they fail and they fail to follow God's commands. And we can't forget, we can't forget that atonement is always part of these commands. That there's always a way that forgiveness is there. But there is this language, and what Moses is doing here. In which at least seems to us as being a little on the uh, not reassuring, is that oh he wants to so oh, perhaps even scare his hearers straight, if you will, to live in God's presence ha- is is not something you can be trivial about. Right, and I, I you know maybe scare them a little bit, and and yet at the same time I think there's there's great encouragement in the way that this text has been been presented, and again the brilliance of Moses as a preacher, in, in choosing his examples wisely, and and showing them the Lord's grace and mercy throughout it all, so that that grace and mercy would be the the motivation for them. Look at look at who your God is. Why wouldn't you listen to him and follow him and go his way? Because you know that that he's the one who seeks to bless you. Yeah, and and the only way you'll ever be able to live in God's presence is by God providing a mediator. Right, right, and that's what that's what you've got here. That's what you've got with Moses, the one who will continue to to preach in in Deuteronomy six. He, he's really going to now kind of turn the corner from a lot of and history doesn't go away by any means, but a lot of this. Okay, you've got the Decalogue. How does that get mediated to you through Moses? How are you going to make use of it in the promised land? That's where where Moses will head in this very lengthy second sermon that he's got here in the book of Deuteronomy. And Dr. Teets, we've got about a minute and a half left here on the morning. Help us to, to wrap things up. Give us the, the good news here from the end of Deuteronomy 5. Uh, the good news is that God continues to dwell with God's people. A- and this language of Artifel, that language of the thick, supernatural darkness, uh, both see, we both see in the past how God dwelled. We see how God provides a mediator. But this is a forward-looking text. It, it looks to Jesus, the, the mediator between us and God, who, who not only teaches us, but also, provide, but also provides the perfect sacrifice so that we can live forever with God. And this text is always forward-looking. Uh, I always love that infamous table prayer, Come Lord Jesus. It is far more dramatic than we give it credit for. Because what it's looking for is for this coming that just like Mount Sinai happened long ago, that we look for God's supernatural presence to come, to set all things right, and so that we may live with God forever. Yeah, this is a fun text. It's been an absolute joy to be with you through these, what, 11 verses, give or take. Yes, sir. It's been fantastic. The Reverend Dr. Ryan Teets is Associate Professor of Exegetical Theology and Dean of Students at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana, helping us today with Deuteronomy 5, verses 22 to 33. Dr. Teets, thank you for being our guest today. Oh, again, an absolute joy to be with you. Moses is the mediator between God and his people Israel. They were right to ask for him to do that. And you and I are right to have a mediator. We need a mediator. God has provided him Jesus Christ. Paul writes in 1 Timothy 2, there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. God be praised for his Savior. I am your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. If you have any questions about the book of Deuteronomy, send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. We always love to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again next week. Mm-hmm.